Well, hello there. My name is Beth Gaff, and I'm the Systems Manager, Technology Trainer, and Robotics Instructor here at the Peabody Public Library. Welcome back to another session of Virtual Field Trips and Visits. Today, we're going to be looking at the Natural History Museum in Utah, as well as another link of the Natural History Museum in LA. There are several of them within the United States, including the Smithsonian. Uh, I may even do a virtual field trip of just the Smithsonian by itself. So uh, definitely, definitely get out there and explore all those different types of natural history museums. I have also included curriculum and lesson plans for you for um, making this a lesson at home for all you homeschooled parents, or perhaps you just follow the field trips and uh, you want to learn a little bit more. So this would help you get along with that. Um, if you need any further assistance with anything else technology-wise, you can always reach out to me here at the Peabody Public Library, and my number here is listed for you. So I do not want to waste any more of our time today. I want to get started on this. Um, I did not explore everything there was on the Natural History Museum in Utah. Uh, so you definitely want to get in there and look at some more of those tours that are available to you, as well as exhibits and exhibitions. So, alrighty, let's get started with natural history museums, uh, the particularly in Utah, um, on our virtual field trips and visits. Well, hello there. My name is Beth Gaff, and I am the systems manager, technology trainer, and robotics instructor here at the Peabody Public Library. Welcome back to another session of virtual field trips. Today we are going to take a look at the National History Museum and I'm going to apologize to you now. I know this is a late getting out on our website, um, but I guess late is better than never and I do ap apologize. I've been swamped and backed up with so many other items that I just didn't get this out. So I'm happy to be able to get this out and hopefully um, our field trip this month will be on time and on the last day of the month. All right, so let's take a look at the National Museum, uh, Natural, sorry, the Natural History Museum. That's what we're going to do. Um, let's go ahead and click on their site, and I will have this link down below for you so you're able to... Um, see what is out there for them. So we're just kind of scrolling. Uh, this museum is located in California. So doing a virtual is probably a good idea. Um, let's just kind of look through some of these fields that they have on here. Let's see. So it looks like we can book a field trip if you wanted to go there. Um, but what we want to do today is a virtual one. So let's see if, let's go to experience the museum. And in here, we've got some live theater, uh, nature gardens, exhibitions, and guided tours. Let's start exploring some of our special exhibitions that are on here. Uh, Jane Goodall, who um, was about all the chimpanzees, so you could read up on her. Uh, they have a National Geographic, it looks like. So they have, in this particular exhibition, they have the Dr. Goodall's extraordinary work, Envision Yourself as a Scientist, uh, you can immerse in Tanzania's stream national park, hear from a hologram from Dr. Goodall, uh, and look at the National Geographic Society items. So that's all in that one. Let's see what this is. I'm always about videos, so let's see what our video is here. As a little girl, thinking about growing up and going to the jungle just seemed like, yeah, that's something I want to do. And there was one particular image that really was burned into my mind. It's this picture of her and she's sitting on a hillside and it's just her and her binoculars and a notebook and that's it. I mean, she's just out in a jungle 
living outside of the limitations that society puts on women. She just seems so adventurous and so cool. Her story is just as cool as her research. For women to be able to do without those expectations, you know, uh, was, was, it kind of means, well, I can do that too. You know, I don't have to do this or I don't have to do that. I can do what I want to do. She has been a real inspiration for me because uh, she did all the things that I would have liked to have done. <laughs> uh, traveled to Africa and done the research and uh, instead I had to live vicariously through her books. I pursued my career in biology partly because I saw women like her that were able to accomplish such incredible things with their research and education. And so my dream job is to work at a museum where I can do things like research and outreach with the public. And it's been really motivating to see women scientists succeed the way that she has. Her research inspires me because she challenged the status quo. Uh, she kind of rethought how research should be done. And um, I think that's an important lesson for us all to think about in regards to our approach to science. Jane has helped humanity to remember its place in the natural order of things. Her message is crucial to our survival as a species. And she reminds us to act with integrity and compassion even when it's not convenient or popular. Not all scientists are white men with beards that look like Charles Darwin. We need to unlearn that and we need to look in the mirror and picture ourselves regardless of what we look like or what we think, picture ourselves in that role. If you're interested in a career in the science and you know that from an early age, stay curious, stay focused. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Follow what you want to do. Have the grit, have the kind of endurance. And sometimes it can be difficult, um, definitely, but if you, um, you know, fail at something, you know, get a lesson from that and continue on. What is the scientific method if not trying something out and seeing what happens? Be courageous, ask questions and be curious. And you can be particularly courageous by asking for help. Uh, find mentors in your field that can help elevate you on your path. And if you don't see your path, that's okay. Make your own. Find somebody who inspires you. It doesn't have to be a woman. It doesn't even have to be a scientist, but somebody who can sort of help give you advice and help you to plot your own trajectory and navigate new worlds uh, is really valuable and uh, don't be afraid to do that, you know, um, and don't feel that there is anything that you can't do. All right, well, that was great advice. Uh, anybody can do and be whatever they want to be. So this is a little bit more about that. Uh, here's a message from her, uh, which I'm going to leave for you so you can kind of take a look at that on your own. Let's go back into here. Uh, here's a special exhibition. So that was uh, the exhibition about Jane Goodall. Let's take a look at this exhibition, Hairy Shiny Insects of L.A. Well, that's just crazy. Um, see large, large format photographs of local insects displayed next to life-size specimens. Listen to the sounds of LA's insects across the span of the day. Nice, nice. Join and give so you can become a member. Um, along those lines, they have a butterfly pavilion. So you would be able to, uh, looks like that one is free for members, $8 per person to go into, see all the stages of the butterfly lifestyle, or life cycle rather, including eggs, caterpillars, feeding on leaves. It includes live animals, very cool. Let's take a look at the nature lab. It's pretty neat here. This is free with your museum admission, so anybody could go in here. 
This is a hot spot of biodiversity, uh, and you can find this nature all around you. Use the tools of the scientist in our large hands-on lab to discover the incredible stories of the LA Wild's plant life. So this would be if you're actually going to go there. So these are exhibitions. I want to see a virtual field trip. Let's see um, if I, I must have just typed it in wrong. I am going to include that link for you though. Okay, there is a Natural History Museum of Utah. So let's take a look at that. Hi, my name is Jason Cryan. I'm the director of the Natural History Museum of Utah, and I would like to welcome you to this fantastic museum. Before we go explore the inside of this museum, take a look at the outside of the building. This museum is clad in copper mined locally from the Kennecott Mine. It's nestled right up against the Wasatch Mountains and has a beautiful view of the Salt Lake Valley. Come, let's explore. As we come up the stairs into the museum proper, you'll be greeted with the sight of our beautiful atrium called the Canyon. This room has a commanding view over the Salt Lake Valley, and also you notice that the walls are irregularly shaped. And that's because they've been scientifically modeled after the mountains just behind the museum building. Your first stop in the journey through the museum today is this relief map of the state of Utah. With this map, we invite you to come and see where you live, where you've been, and where you would like to go in this great state of Utah. Before we explore the museum exhibits, I wanted to point out our collections wall. Most people don't realize that at our core, this museum is based on research and collections. We have more than 1.6 million specimens in our collections, most of which the public will never see. They're held for research purposes. This wall has 600 of them that we use as examples of all of the breadth of biodiversity, of geological diversity that we hold in these collections. We have an app called the Trailhead to Utah, which gives you all kinds of information about this museum. Let's listen to what my colleagues have to say about this collections wall. The collections wall is designed as a work of art and it's meant to show how extraordinarily beautiful nature can be. What makes our institution special is our, our collections. It's our heart and soul, it's our, at our core. Butterflies with fossils, fossils with plants, historic pots. The baskets represent extreme work and labor. Insects are pink and chrome color and black and brown and fuzzy and striped and polka dotted and they're more beautiful than jewels. Thanks very much for joining us today. You're in for an exciting visit. I invite you to continue your exploration by selecting some of the videos below. We can't wait to meet you in person on your next visit to the museum. Okay, well that was a fun one. So evidently we wanted the natural history of museum. Uh, however, I am going to include, um, let me go back. Yeah, I am going to include this natural natural history museum from LA County as well, because it looks like it's going to have a lot of beneficial information. Let's just kind of look through these tabs here. You can plan a visit. Uh, and these are all the information about that. This is about them and all of their items, programs that you can get involved in, including tours and events, uh, being able to support and join. Uh, collections and research areas, outreach, and being able to contact them. So, welcome to the Natural History uh, Museum of Utah. The museum is an active research institution and one of our state's top visitor attractions. Each year, the museum hosts approximately 300,000 guests from around the world, including 40,000 students visiting, visiting on free field trips. We are proud to share our virtual field trips with you. Listed below, you'll find virtual experiences developed and led by our expert scientists and educators. Here you can visit our permanent exhibits, our current special exhibition, and our past special exhibitions. During the time of the museum and the school closures, we are happy to provide students and lifelong learners with a taste of all the Natural History Museum of Utah offers. So uh, they have a backyard. The background ba backyard is an intimate discovery-based environmental design for younger museum visitors to experience the natural history firsthand. Entering the exhibit 
guests will come face to face with live animals and insects native to Utah and explore an underground crawl area and get their hands wet in the stream play. You've got the past worlds. This is a journey through millions of years of Utah ancient environment. Uh, the Great Salt Lake. This is um, the once massive lake, which stretched 300 plus miles at the end. So you're going to learn all about the Great Salt Lake and the surrounding. Uh, first people exhibition. They have land, life, and native voices. And then here is an, a few archived ones. Um, so let's just kind of see what we're working with here. Let's take a tour here. And it really just depends on how long. So this is for the younger kids. This one is seven minutes long. Let's go ahead and watch this video. You can watch it with me or you can watch it on your own. Hi, welcome to our backyard at the Natural History Museum of Utah. Here, we invite our youngest visitors to play and explore. What will you discover while crawling in the tunnel or floating in the stream? What will you find chomping in the trees or living in the walls? Welcome to our backyard. Our backyard is home to over a dozen animals, most of them native to Utah. Here you'll find amphibians, reptiles, insects, and arachnids. Sometimes you have to wait and look closely to spot them. Let's learn more about some of these animals and how we care for them here in the Critter Care Room. Welcome to the Critter Care Room. All animals need certain things to survive. They need food, water, oxygen, and shelter, a safe place. In the wild, animals find these things in their habitats. Here at the museum, everything the animals need is right here in the critter care room. Most of our animals here eat crickets or vegetables or mice. So we have a place for those, full of all of those yummy goodies. We also make sure that the animals get fed the right number of times. So when our volunteers come in to feed the animals, they keep track on our critter care sheet. Did each animal get enough food, water? Was their enclosure cleaned? Was their temperature correct? everything the animals need to stay safe, happy, and healthy. We also have animals that live here. When animals are on display all the time, that can get exhausting. So we have other animals that can substitute for them and the animals on display can take a break. We also have ways to get into the animal enclosures from here in the critter care room. Hey, here's our first animal. You ever seen an animal like this before? It's got slimy skin with spots, four legs and a tail. This is a tiger salamander. We have tiger salamanders here in Utah, but they can be hard to find. They spend a lot of time burrowed underground or hiding under rocks. Now, they are amphibians like frogs, toads, newts, which means that they go through a life cycle. They lay eggs in the water, that hatch into tadpole-like babies that live in the water. As they grow, they grow legs and lungs and then come out of the water as adults. They are predators. They hunt insects, slugs, snails, but here at the museum, they eat crickets and mealworms. Let's see, here's a fun fact about salamanders. They don't drink water. Instead, they soak up water through their skin. They can just sit in a puddle or in the mud and drink up the water right through their skin. So next time you are out by a pond or a freshwater stream, take a look under some rocks. You might be able to find a tiger salamander in your own backyard. All right, let's get this guy back home. Bye, little guy. Next, we have our brown tarantula. You can find these throughout Utah and many parts of the Western US. You'll notice up close that you have two front structures. They look a lot like legs, but really they're what we call pedipalps. They're used to hold their prey and also used to mate in the males. This one is a female. And we like to have females because they live longer. One thing you also notice are these fine hairs. They use these hairs and we call them urticating hairs and they'll shoot them out at any predators that would come by and try to attack it. And it tells them, ooh, I don't want to mess with this animal. This is a scary animal. I don't like this feeling. 
Uh, you'll notice the eight legs, you'll find that in spiders and that's one of their adaptations too. You'll find tarantulas in burrows typically, other spiders might be in webs, but you'll find them underground. And you can even see one of their food items right in here is a cricket. And here at the museum, we feed them crickets and compared to the different things they might eat in the wild, which would be insects or mice even. But for the most part, brown tarantulas are very docile animals. Next, we have our horned lizard. And you can find these throughout Utah and much of the Americas. You're gonna find them in hot, sandy, dry environments. Let's take a look at their adaptations. So if you look closely at it, you'll notice the colors even. So their colors match a lot of the desert. So they have um, brown colors, kind of some reddish colors. It really depends where you are. They're gonna fit their environment because that helps them camouflage and blend in better. Next up, you're gonna notice these spikes on its back and also on the back of its head. So these spikes are very useful. They're good for threatening any predators. If you come up to this, maybe you're a coyote and you think, well, I'm gonna eat that. It's gonna puff up and flatten out a bit and it's gonna present those spikes. And you're gonna probably back off because it can be a very intimidating lizard when you're just some other predator. So we're gonna go ahead and put this little guy back. There we go. Also in captivity, we like to make sure they stay hydrated. So they're not the best at drinking water in captivity. So what we do is we have a spray bottle and we just give them a nice little mist. All right, now it's time for one of my personal favorite reptiles. Do you have a guess of what this might be? This is a gopher snake. Now, if you guessed a rattlesnake, well, you're not far off. Gopher snakes are adapted to mimic rattlesnakes. If you can see the end of his tail, it doesn't have a rattle on it. But when gopher snakes are threatened by a predator, they can shake the end of their tail and hiss to mimic a venomous rattlesnake. Now, gopher snakes aren't venomous. They are constrictors. They kill their prey by squeezing it super tight, like a boa or an anaconda. They can be found here in Utah, especially right here around the museum. And they hunt and eat mice, rats, other rodents. Now, if you run into a gopher snake, you should give it space because it can bite. Anything with teeth can bite you, but they're not venomous, so it wouldn't be dangerous like a rattlesnake. Uh, here at the museum, we actually have three gopher snakes. We have a dad and two younger snakes. This one is named Spot. He's lived here at the museum for about eight years. Here's an odd thing. Here at the museum, we feed our snakes about one mouse every two weeks. That might not seem like very much, but that's what they need to stay healthy. Snakes are adapted to only eat when they can catch their prey. So if we fed them more mice more often, they wouldn't be very healthy. All right, I think I'm gonna go ahead and return Spot back to his enclosure. Bye-bye. Thanks for exploring our backyard and seeing some of our animals here at the Natural History Museum of Utah. Now it's your turn. Go explore your backyard. What animals and plants can you find there? I think you'll be surprised what you can discover. Till next time, thanks for exploring our backyard with us. Bye-bye. All right, well, that was a great, great video. I really learned a lot about some of the animals that they have there. So um, you can explore a little bit more on that. Let's take a look at the a tour on the past worlds. And it looks like they have a few of these. We are not gonna look at all of these. Um, we're just gonna look at the very first one and then you can go even deeper and explore on the rest of these. Welcome to the Past Worlds exhibit of the Natural History Museum of Utah, where we explore over 150 million years of Utah's ancient past. Today, the Great Salt Lake is a fantastic place to see living dinosaurs, all those birds flying above us. And though the shorelines are teeming with life, in the water, there's not much else besides brine shrimp. But about 12,000 years ago, it was very different matter here in Utah. The Great Salt Lake was much larger, a big body of fresh water called Lake Bonneville. And it not only had all sorts of fish living in it, but all sorts of other animals along its lake shores, including things like mammoths and mastodons and saber-toothed cats. 
And in the Wasatch Mountains, we had glaciers. So it was a very different world, even though it was just a few thousand years ago. Further back in time, some 50 million years ago during the Eocene, much of Utah and Wyoming was covered in large freshwater lakes. These lakes were teeming with life with all sorts of birds, as well as mammals, including this early relative of humans, Nothartis, on this branch. There were also strange microbial structures called stromatolites, which we also find in the Great Salt Lake today. Now we're back 75 million years ago during the Cretaceous period. And you can see that all the different animals around back then were quite different. We have large meat-eating tyrannosaurs like Teratophonius behind me, large alligators like Dinosuchus, and the environment was quite different too. We had broad, slow-moving streams and rivers crisscrossing Utah that would have looked similar to what we see in southern Louisiana today. We're finally back 150 million years ago during the late Jurassic period, when Utah was covered with an open savanna-like environment that had a few large rivers and streams. And walking on this landscape were all sorts of classic dinosaurs, like Utah's state fossil Allosaurus, and the giant long-necked plant-eating sauropod dinosaurs, like Barosaurus. This is sort of the iconic dinosaurian landscape, and it shows how much Utah has changed over the past 150 million years. All right, so that just gives you a little bit of a highlight, but they have a lot more exhibits that you can check out on your own. We don't want to make this class a two-hour class, so we're going to try to keep it as minimal as possible, but uh, you can explore a little more in that area. Let's check out tours from the Great Salt Lake. They do have a few of those. Uh, let's just watch the first one here. Hi everyone, welcome to the Great Salt Lake exhibit, where we're going to be learning more about how the lake has changed over time and its significance to modern life. But to start our explorations, we'll need to go back millions of years to the Pleistocene epoch. The Pleistocene lasted from 2.6 million years ago to 12,000 years ago. This epoch experienced the most recent ice age and features animals such as mammoths and mastodons. Along with these distinctive large land mammals, the Pleistocene hosted many species still alive today, such as some birds, mammals, flowering plants, and insects. The end of the Pleistocene saw the extinction of many large land mammals, such as the mammoths. To learn more about this topic, make sure to check out our videos from the Past Worlds exhibit. An important feature here in Utah during the Pleistocene was Lake Bonneville, an ancient lake that formed about 32,000 years ago. This lake was much larger than the modern Great Salt Lake. Lake Bonneville spanned about 325 miles in length, reaching into Idaho and down the western side of Utah to about Milford. It stretched out covering the West Desert and came all the way up here to the Natural History Museum of Utah. Here, we would be standing on the shores of the lake. You can see on the map here an outline of where the lake would have been compared to where we are today. Lake Bonneville was home to many animals, including fish, birds, and mammoths. Unlike the modern lake, Lake Bonneville was fresh water, not salt water. The lake was fed by precipitation, rivers and streams, and even melting glaciers. This fresh water was able to support a different scope of life than the salt water from the modern lake. Take a look out your window. What do you think your neighborhood looked like during the Pleistocene? So how did Lake Bonneville become the Great Salt Lake we all know today? Over thousands of years, Lake Bonneville experienced multiple flood events that broke through natural dams in Idaho, lowering the water level in the lake. Combined with this, Utah became warmer and drier than it was during the Pleistocene epoch. As climate changed, the lake experienced more evaporation and continued to shrink in size. As Lake Bonneville shrank, it left behind multiple remnants, including Utah Lake, Severe Lake, the Bonneville Salt Flats, and of course, the Great Salt Lake. The Great Salt Lake exists in the lowest depression of the Great Basin. The Great Basin is the watershed we live in that spans almost all of Nevada, much of Oregon and Utah, and parts of Idaho, California, and Wyoming. Due to the location of the Great Salt Lake in the lowest depression, it is a terminal lake, meaning that water flows into the lake, but no water flows out of the lake. This is what causes the lake's signature high salinity levels. All water has some salt, but freshwater typically has very little. The water flowing into the Great Salt Lake has very low salt levels, but as the water continues to evaporate from the lake, the salt level, or salinity, becomes more concentrated or higher. This high salinity creates a home for animals and plants with specific adaptations, such as saltgrass and brine shrimp. Now you may be asking yourself if the lake is finished changing, and it isn't. The lake is constantly undergoing change, 
and will continue to do so into the future as the industry changes around its banks and its climate change continues. Modern day changes can be observed by noticing the level of the lake. The most recent flood from the Great Salt Lake was in 1983, when there was so much water that some of the streets of Salt Lake City were turned into rivers. Another place to observe the water level changes is the spiral jetty. The spiral jetty is a land art by Robert Smithson, created in 1970. Over the years, the lake level has sometimes covered the art piece, but right now it is above water and can easily be visited. Another way to see how the lake has changed over time is to look for the microbialites. Microbialites are large, bulbous, sedimentary rock formations created by blue and green algae. These formations used to be commonplace in environments millions of years ago, but now only grow in extreme environments, like the Great Salt Lake, due to grazing animals. Microbialites would not have existed in Lake Bonneville due to the freshwater, but the Great Salt Lake is the perfect home for microbialites to thrive in today because the high salinity levels decreases the number of other animals, plants, and algae that might compete for space or nutrients. Microbialites are one more piece of the puzzle that scientists study to understand the way our environment has changed over time. Okay, so that was all about the Great Salt Lake. There is another one that uh, you can watch to keep going on that. Uh, let's take a look at First Peoples. Looks like there's only one video and I am not gonna watch that. I'm gonna leave that for you to watch on your own. Uh, let's see what other ones they have here. We've got land, several videos on land. Um, again, I am just going to leave this for you to uh, watch on your own. I think you get the kind of the idea of how this virtual field trip is going to work. Uh, this is another one you can watch all about the life. There are native voices, several or a couple of videos for that. Here's some archived videos. I am a little curious about this one. Uh, so they have a dinosaur a virtual one that they've that they've done. So you have a few of those you can watch. Let's take a look at the tabs at the top. So we program, let's see what their programs and events, uh, what's happening. So this tells you about items that are happening within their establishment. Kids and families, adults, birthday parties, you can join and support. There's some research items that you could look into, some outreach, outreach traveling treasures. So this is about unique Utah. So these are all your traveling treasures. So you could go in and check those out during those dates or uh, by then they may even have something on here that you would be able to see by yourself. And then you have all of this stuff down here uh, for educators. Let's see what they've got here. Educator workshops. Uh, again, a lot of this is in person, but they do have <clears throat> excuse me, a virtual side to this as well. Let's see here. All right, and it looks like, I don't know if I have any lesson plans, but um, I am going to go ahead and download some lesson plans. So I'm going to get us some lesson plans on here. Um, that way you have them for when you do your trip. There's quite a few on there. I was just going to go see if I could find that in my purchases now. OK, I will mess with that later, but I am going to have some items on there for you for the Natural um, History of Museum. So you're able to have some pretty cool um, curriculum and lesson plans available to you that you're going to be able to download for free, um, as well as I'm encouraging you to explore out. You can also like their page on Facebook. 
so you can get some of the most updated information that they have. This is the one in Utah. Um, again, I would encourage you to explore to see if there's other natural history museums. We obviously found one that was in LA, which I'm going to include for you. This is not virtual, however, they do have a lot of um, educational resources on there. All right, you guys, well, thank you so much for being a part of our virtual field trip today. I'm gonna make sure to get those lesson plans on there for you. Um, make sure you venture out to some of those other tours that they offer on here. I just didn't want this to be a two hour video. It's really about you exploring on your own. And I was just kind of guiding you to get you going. So hopefully this starter video got you going and you were able to get out there and explore even more. So thanks so much for being a part of it. I wanna thank uh, the Natural History Museum of Utah as well as LA for allowing us to use their websites. Uh, Screenomatic, of course, like always, Google for all their images, uh, and Microsoft for allowing me to use PowerPoint to make the videos for you. So, all right, you guys, thanks so much. I will see you next month um, with another virtual field trip, and this time it will be on time. So thanks so much. Have a great one. Bye.